What I'd like to do is start with a very short video explaining why I wrote this book. Uh, it shows how my background in rural Ohio led to my interest in this subject. So we'll start with the video. I started out poor. I grew up on a dairy farm in southern Ohio. So I used to milk the cows before I would go to school every morning. When my parents first moved to that house, it did not have running water or an indoor bathroom. The cows got running water before the house did because it was more important for the barn to have it. Through education, I attended public high schools and public universities. I spent 26 years teaching political science at Brown University and met my first billionaire. Eventually came to Washington, D.C. and now uh, work as a vice president at the leading clean tank in the world. We now are seeing billionaires become much more active in trying to influence the election process. They're spending tens or hundreds of millions of dollars pursuing their own partisan objectives, often in secret from the American public. And so it's really the combination of wealth and secrecy that is most problematic about the contemporary period. I wrote the book to provide a much better understanding of who these people are and how they're using their money in the political process. The big challenge of our current period in having all these billionaires with great fortunes is oftentimes they're able to influence elections and government in secret. I was talking with a wealthy individual, and he described what he called a get a senator strategy. If you can get one senator to basically put a hold on an appointment you don't like or stop a bill that you don't want, that can be a very powerful way to affect the political process. The Supreme Court decisions have uh, put huge loopholes into our campaign finance laws. There used to be much more required disclosure. Uh, now, wealthy people can influence the process. They can spend tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in secret and nobody else knows about it. Wealthy people have the right to try and influence the process in the same way that every other American does, but we need to know how this big money is coming into the political process. Okay, so I'd like to thank uh, George uh, Boros, uh, Christine Jacobs, and the video team at Brookings for producing that video. I thought they really did a great uh, job on that. So I wrote this book because I was really curious about billionaires. I wanted to know who they are, how they got rich, and what are they doing with their immense wealth. I also wanted to know what are they like as individuals. Between teaching at Brown University for 26 years and now being at Brookings for about uh, six years, I've had encounters with a number of different uh, billionaires. And so I think my experiences reveal some interesting tidbits about their mentality and their uh, viewpoints. I was once visiting a billionaire friend of mine in Palm Beach. And of course, he has a beautiful place uh, right on the uh, water overlooking uh, the ocean. And one morning we were sitting on the patio overlooking the water when a helicopter flew very noisily right down uh, the coast, kind of completely disturbing the serenity of that uh, morning. And my friend rolled his eyes and said, oh, that's my neighbor. And it turns out that instead of driving his car two miles down the road to go to the golf course, this guy flew his helicopter. So this is an example of billionaires annoying other billionaires. <laughs> In 2012, I had an experience of a billionaire annoying me. 
I was asked that year uh, about the possibility of Donald Trump speaking at the Republican uh, uh, National Convention. And I joked in the article that uh, Republicans should actually send him on an all expenses trip around the world because if he actually spoke at the convention, he would bring the party uh, nothing but trouble. Now, I didn't really think too much about making those uh, comments, but the morning my quote appeared uh, in the paper, I got a call from Trump's assistant requesting my email address. And shortly thereafter, his assistant sent me an angry missive from uh, the billionaire himself. And what Trump had done was he pasted my comment about him into the body of the email, and then he wrote in big, black, bold letters, Daryl, you are a fool. Best wishes, Donald J. Trump. <laughs> Which, you know, I really appreciated the best uh, wishes there. Uh, I actually have this note framed in my office. The only thing I didn't understand was he put air quotes around fool, and that made me think that I was actually being more stupid than a typical fool. And, you know, prior to that interaction, I hadn't realized there were actually gradations in being a fool. Uh, and that's the, uh, the note that he sent. Uh, but it was the first billionaire that I met at Brown University who propelled uh, this book. And that actually is Ted Turner. About 20 years ago, Ted Turner came to Brown uh, to give a lecture. And his visit was noteworthy because he'd actually been kicked out of Brown for disciplinary uh, code violations, uh, mainly involving wine and women. And, and I'm not sure if it was in that order or not. But uh, So we hosted him for a lecture, and he came with his then wife, Jane Fonda. So you know, this is a big deal for the university. It was a, a glitzy occasion. And he actually gave a very a funny speech. He said that his favorite thing about having a ranch out west was being able to urinate off the front porch. Uh, which for this Ivy League crowd, that was a little racy uh, for us, but you know, we laughed. But then he turned more serious, and in his remarks, he discussed wealth, and he said, the first million is the hardest. After that, money begets money, and everything else is easier. Wealthy people have social, economic, and political connections, and those things uh, make uh, it much easier to make money. So I thought a lot about that comment during the 2012 uh, presidential elections. We saw a number of super, super wealthy individuals pour a lot of money into the campaign. Of course, uh, the most famous uh, individuals uh, doing that were Charles and David uh, Koch, who've devoted hundreds of millions of dollars uh, seeking uh, first to defeat uh, President Obama, and then now, of course, they're very active in this year's uh, campaign. Uh, Sheldon Adelson wasn't far behind. He was an early supporter of Newt Gingrich, but then shifted to Romney during the general election. But it turns out that they are not the only billionaires who are politically active. Uh, Michael Bloomberg uh, this year has put $50 million into fighting gun violence. He's also uh, very active in promoting immigration reform. George Soros supports a number of liberal grassroots uh, organizations. Tom Steyer is probably one of the less known of the politically active uh, billionaires, uh, but this year he pledged $100 million to raise public awareness about uh, climate change. So in researching this uh, phenomena, I discovered it's really not just an American phenomena, but it is a global development. Billionaires actually have run for office in 12 different countries around the world, and most of the time they actually end up uh, winning. The most famous is uh, uh, Berlusconi uh, in Italy, uh, but more recently we have the case of Poroshenko, who is the new president of uh, Ukraine. Uh, the political activism of these and other billionaires raises important questions about excessive political influence, conflicts of interest, and poor transparency when it comes to uh, money and politics. We are seeing what I call in the book the wealthification of politics and society at many different levels. And many have written about the economic consequences of wealth. I wanted to look at the political impact of a great wealth. So there are uh, 1,645 known billionaires, according to Forbes magazine, and 492 of them live in the United States. And I think it's really important to understand the impact they're having on our political uh, process. Uh, one of the things I wanted to look at is there are several aspects that I think are particularly important in terms of the context in which this activism is taking place. One is the high level of income concentration that we're seeing. Here I have a chart from Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel uh, Saez, which shows the dramatic rise of income concentration between 1913 and 2000.